Hello and welcome to TechDredge. This is my wallet. See how it's empty? That's because I took up videography as a hobby. Ladies and gentlemen, I present to you the Blackmagic Ursa. It's big, it's black, it's just the way I like it. And I'm presenting it in chapters because there's a lot to cover. Fair warning, because of the low price point of this camera, it's obtainable to non-professionals coming from a DSLR workflow, such as myself. And that's the angle I'll be approaching this review from. Also, it goes on for a while, so there's a chapter selection down there. The Ursa is Blackmagic's top-of-the-line digital film camera that is designed along the lines of big-budget Hollywood cameras, and it is the sort of thing you'd expect to see as the main camera on a Hollywood film. Its design is multiple operator friendly and can shoot in either 4K or 4.6K at high frame rates depending on the sensor you choose. I'm going to focus mostly on the ergonomics and workflow of the camera in this review. Uh, Blackmagic are the industrial design kings and other camera manufacturers need to start realizing that functional products can be good looking as well. Ursa is made of a heavy duty, exceptionally high quality magnesium alloy all around. Every aspect of the camera looks great and feels robust. Ursa is divided into stations to have up to three people working on the camera at one time, such as the director, a focus puller and an audio guy. It's also well set up to be able to use as a one-man band with all of the controls being easily accessible from multiple points. The first station is the director station. It encompasses the massive 10 inch glossy screen which is phenomenally good. The screen is bright, is a 16x10, 1920 by 1200 resolution which makes pulling tack sharp focus really easy and really enjoyable. On the left of the screen you have a few buttons including record, playback, granular iris adjustment, a zoom button that punches into the center of the screen to help make pulling focus even easier, a display button that toggles focus peaking, frame guides and status indicators on and off, and a program button for viewing a live feed from other cameras in your setup. The screen is rotatable 90 degrees, it should be rotatable 180 degrees. That would make my life so much easier. On the inside you have two card slots for the CFAS 2.0 cards that the Ursa takes, a smaller 5 inch standard definition display and control buttons along the bottom. These buttons include an auto iris button which is hit and miss but generally just uh, sets the lens to its highest f-stop, a push to focus button which is next to useless, it seems to just guess where to focus but it can theoretically be improved with firmware, though this is a cinema camera so most users should be using manual focus anyway. Most cinema lenses don't even have an auto focus motor. There is a peaking button to turn focus peaking on and off. Focus peaking is simply a green outline around whatever's in focus and on the Ursa it works fantastically well. Coupled with the great screens, Ursa is a really enjoyable camera to pull focus on. Next up is the display button, which switches the screen between recording status and actually displaying what the camera is seeing. And there is a slate button as well for inputting metadata, which is nice in theory but impractical to use in the field. Finally, there's a power button for turning the camera off and on. The camera turns on with just one press of the button and takes about 5 seconds to boot up. To turn it off, you need to hold the button down for a few seconds, a necessary touch to stop you accidentally turning the camera off. I'd have also liked to see a record button on here somewhere, since sometimes using the one on the screen can cause the camera to shake a little bit. Hopefully that can be implemented onto the touch screen with a firmware update. If you close the big screen, all the important controls are replicated on the outside for use when shoulder mounted. The back of the camera by default is just a metal plate, but if you unscrew it, you can plug in a battery plate like I've got here. There's a Molex connector hidden under all of that. The camera does not include an internal battery. On the other side, you have a good selection of connections. You have 12G SDR video out, so you can output full 4K resolution to an external monitor or recorder. You also have SDR video in, so you can actually view a live program feed or just a view from another camera on the Ursa's great screen. I can see this being really helpful if you have something like the Blackmagic Micro Studio camera as a B-cam and just need a screen to help pull focus on. It would be really useful though if you could actually record the feed onto the Ursa's CFast cards, that would be awesome. Hopefully that will change in a firmware update because the Ursa would make a great recorder. You have ref in for synchronizing two cameras side by side in a 3D setup and you have time code in and out to easily manage multi-cam setups and external audio recording. Finally, there's a 12 volt power in for powering the camera without a battery. Right next to these connectors you have an audio station, which includes these beautiful visual audio monitors, which you can easily see from right across the room. And they're one of the many reasons I bought this camera. The monitors clearly show when audio is clipping and when all is good. 
There are controls for muting audio channels and dials for adjusting the levels. There's also a headphone input next to a link remote control jack. There are in-camera audio options to duplicate mono channels uh, to provide stereo sound, or you can of course have different microphones on each channel. Also on the side is a duplicate of the 5-inch screen on the direct station with all the same buttons. This is useful if you have a focus puller on this side of the camera and the director is hugging the big screen on the other side. You can zoom in on the screen to help you with focus by double tapping, or though it always zooms into the center, it would be very useful if you could drag the image around while zoomed in, and this should definitely be in a firmware update. Even though the screen is small, I have no problem pulling focus, although sometimes I do have to use peaking, not that that's a complaint. In front of the screen, you have another SDI video out, which is conveniently positioned for if you want to use a viewfinder, as well as 12 volt power out for accessories. And below that, you have two XLR microphone ports, which are capable of powering a microphone with phantom power. The front of the camera includes the sexy lens turret, which is removable and upgradable. I have the 4K sensor in here at the moment with a Canon EF mount, though I will be upgrading to the 4.6K sensor when it becomes readily available, unless Blackmagic announces something even better, which they probably will. You can also choose to use this with a CinemaLens PL mount, which I'm guessing most professionals will opt for, but I prefer the Canon EF mount because, structural issues aside, it allows for a great range of lenses and all of your photography lenses will still be compatible. If you need to spend $150 on a pancake lens, you can do that. If you need to spend $50,000 on a high-end cinema zoom lens, you can do that too and use them interchangeably. All EF and EFS lenses will fit. Below the lens mount are two inbuilt microphones. These aren't great, but if you look at my first videos where the sound quality was abysmal, I was using a cheap dedicated lav mic and the Ursa inbuilt microphones are better. Not usable in professional products by any means because the sound is very tinny and has no depth or warmth to it, but if I was in a pinch, I could make it work. This is the Ursa inbuilt microphone from a distance of at least 3 meters, the usual distance I do when I'm filming these reviews. And below the microphones are a really cool thing, rail mounts. This is a lifesaver in some situations. If you want to take the camera off the tripod and still have the rig attached, then you can do that no problem. Or you can hot swap different rig setups depending on what you're using the camera for. Really cool. The bottom of the camera includes a Sony VCT-14 quick release mount, so you can mount this to a tripod without using any screws. Though this isn't really optional. I couldn't figure out how to remove the mount, so you have to use a quick release plate. But it is worth it. There's also a USB port down here for updating firmware. The top of the camera includes a very useful top handle which has 3 8 inch mounting points all along it. The top handle is adjustable with the right allen key and you can either flip it around, bring it forward or remove it altogether. Behind the handle is a vent. The camera is liquid cooled which I'm sure contributes to the hefty weight but also the low noise and excellent performance in hot temperatures. The camera comes in at 7.5 kilograms with no lenses or accessories attached. While it's a bit heavy, the size is perfect for me and I wouldn't want anything physically smaller. Though Blackmagic does a less powerful Ursa Mini if you're interested, but it doesn't do much for me at all. For me, image quality is really the least important thing uh, in video, especially for web distribution, so I'm not really going to harp on about it. There are plenty of other reviewers that have covered it, and frankly it's audio that is the most important part of the video for me. A good cinematographer is more important than a good camera, no matter how you're distributing. That said, Ursa has pretty much the highest quality video you're going to get out of any camera south of $50,000, though RED now has a few interesting options at the lower end. The, the creme de la creme of the Ursa's video is its raw footage. Raw footage is basically just a bunch of uncompressed still images taken in rapid succession. Each frame is about 8 megabytes in size and you can shoot uncompressed 4K 4000 by 2160 RAW at 60 frames per second. That is insanity. It's also a metric fuck ton of data that's incredibly hard to work with. At 60 FPS you will fill a 128 gigabyte memory card in a little over 3 minutes. The things you can do in RAW are pretty amazing though. You can recover overexposed areas, bring out colour you can't even see with the naked eye, and lift shadows but it's just too painful to work with clips more than a few seconds long, even on my high-end workstation. There is a 3 to 1 compressed RAW option as well, which is neat to have, but is currently only supported on DaVinci Resolve software, which is pretty great software and is included with the camera, but until Adobe includes support in Premiere, I won't be using it. 
you can shoot this compressor at up to 120 frames per second. Like I said, insanity. A great little feature of the Ursa is to be able to use two memory cards to record RAW files. So the camera will record every alternating frame on a different memory card and if you, for instance, lose one card, you will still have your video, just at half the frame rate. It also helps prevent dropped frames. Apple ProRes XQ would be my codec of choice. It gives you most of that awesome dynamic range that RAW does, but instead of being a folder full of still images, it is an easy to work with encoded video. Unfortunately, Apple has not made it available to Windows users, so I'm stuck using ProRes HQ, which is still a pretty damn good format and still lets you do 120 frames per second continuously in 4K. When shooting in ProRes, you can choose between film and video mode. Film mode gives you a flat image, which is ideal for fine color grading, while video mode gives you a saturated image that is ready for deployment almost straight away. I've always shot in video mode until my video last week on the Dolphin emulator, where I moved to film mode and you can just see how good the latitude is here. This is the image taken straight out of camera. And here it is when graded. So deliciously vibrant. Another good video to watch is Retin Link, Are You Gonna Eat That? which is shot on an Ursa and makes really good use of bright colors for the web. As I've mentioned, you can do up to 120 frames per second in 4K, which is pretty awesome. You can get some really cool results with that. Though it's hard to use inside because at 120 frames per second, not as much light gets into the camera, so you have to fill a room with just all of the lights. I use high frame rates on close-ups of products when I'm panning so I can move my slider fast and smooth and still have a nice slow motion pan in the editing room. If you zoom into the center of the sensor to windowed high definition mode, you can push 150 frames per second, which is on the verge of super slow motion. That is just how powerful this camera is. You can also shoot non-windowed downscaled high definition if you are trying to save space. I always shoot in 4K though because it allows you the liberty of being able to zoom in and out and do virtual pans and cool things like that. Time-lapse mode is always in RAW and has plenty of options to get you some nice shots. Black hole sun is still an issue on the 4K sensor but is easily removed in post in most situations and it's completely gone on the 4.6K sensor. Some people complain about low light on this camera and I don't really get it. Sure, the maximum sensitivity is ASA 800 on the 4K version and the 4.6K camera improves upon that, but using a fast lens gets me considerably better low light performance than I ever got on a DSLR. Usually when I'm shooting these reviews on my Ursa, I only have one light turned on. Uh, shooting on my DSLR today, I have five. If you do drastically underexpose though, you'll get some pretty dreadful fixed pattern noise on the 4K sensor. This is a cinema camera and is meant to be used where you have some control over lighting though I'm still yet to have a problem with ambient light. To get the Ursa running, the only absolutely necessary things you need are a memory card and a lens. The Ursa uses CFast 2.0 cards, which are now relatively affordable if you live in the US. I think they've actually gotten more expensive here though than they were a year ago, but that's what the gray market is for and I was able to import a 128 gigabyte card for as low as 75 bucks and bought another one from the US for about $300. You will also need a CFast reader to play back the files, though mine came free with the Transcend CFast card I bought from B and H Photo. The tripod is the next problem. Most consumer level tripods simply cannot take this weight. The only one that can is the Manfrotto 509 HD head and whatever sticks you choose. This will likely set you back about $1,500 and is the bare minimum. But don't think you can just mount the camera to a tripod. You will also need a Sony Star VCT14 quick release plate. The official Sony one costs about $300, but you can get a knockoff that's just as good for about $200. Next, you'll need a battery solution. I recommend getting the official Blackmagic V mount plate, since at $100 it's cheap, and it also includes an additional power connector for powering things that aren't the camera. If you are using different batteries, such as a gold mount battery, you can buy third-party mounting plates for them too. In terms of battery, I thoroughly recommend these Power UV mount batteries. The Ursa has three bright screens, so you need at least a 130 watt hour battery, which will power the camera for about an hour and a half. But I recommend upgrading to a 190 watt hour, because you need that extra battery life. These Power U batteries also include a D-tap connector for powering other devices, have their own inbuilt status indicator, and are rechargeable from the wall so you don't have to buy an expensive charger. 
These batteries are fairly new and it's only because of Blackmagic releasing cameras like this at such low price points that you can now get these kinds of accessories relatively cheaply compared to even a year ago. You can forget putting this on a slider for anything less than $10,000. So track dolly is the way to go. I bought this dolly for less than $300 Australian, but it doesn't have a name so I can't share it with you. It is surprisingly well built though. If you want to shoulder mount this camera, you'll need a good shoulder kit, such as those from Wooden Camera for about two grand and an additional one and a half thousand dollars for a viewfinder. I'd also recommend checking out some sun visors and mounting points from Wooden Camera if you shoot out in the sun a lot. So it will add up, but you can definitely get a good tripod rig for under 10 grand, and which considering the functionalities of this camera is a damn good deal. Even if you are buying a 20 or 50 or hundred thousand dollar camera, you'll still have to get these accessories. So to conclude, I love my Ursa. Its weight increases the expensive accessories, but I wouldn't really change it. The size and shape is ergonomically perfect for studio or cinema use, with easily visible audio monitors and great screens for pulling focus and inbuilt rail supports make this camera really easy to set up and a joy to use. When I was buying this, I was tossing up between the Ursa and the Blackmagic Studio camera with an external recorder, and while I think I probably made the overkill choice, I'm glad I did. I definitely hope to check out the studio camera one day, but the Ursa still excites me because it can do so much. Whenever I read about a new, new technique in either videography or post-production, I know I'm going to be able to just go out and test it with this camera. Obviously, watching this, you can tell I'm not a professional cinematographer and probably never will be, but every single week I'm learning something new and that's so exciting and why I love this camera. Thanks for watching TechDredge. I will see you next week with a video on well, I don't know what I'm reviewing since I'm out of town for a couple of days, but I'm shopping for a new Bluetooth speaker, so expect that. Have a good one, like and subscribe if you like and want to see more.